Shiv Bhagwan sir had hosted a series of uh, you know, local for vocal series, one of the very famous series which was uh, held by Shiv sir. And therefore, uh, after a long gap, a thorough webinar wherein we are holding a technical session discussion today. So I welcome you all and thank you for your uh, patience uh, joining this session. And we are also expecting a lot of people to join in more. So this, there was a specific thought behind uh, hosting a session on forensic audit. Because one being is being the very emerging area. And secondly, a lot of people are having some myths or some uh, ill understandings on forensic audit is what I strongly feel. And of course, we have a very learned speaker to guide us through on the aspects of forensic audit. So definitely, as far as the technical side of the subject is concerned, he is uh, one of the masters at, it, masters at it. So he will turn it better. Further, on behalf of Sane branch, before I go on to introduce our speaker for today, I would just like to make an announcement that on 25th of May, that is next Saturday, we are hosting a one-day conference with the title Penathon. That uh, event will be held at Arnas Banquet Hall at Wagale Estate. The event timing is 9 to 4 p.m. The event specifically is to cover the topics in specific, the capital markets, the SME IPOs and the categories, I mean, the IPO and the ideas around the IPO, SME IPO in specific. Then uh, we have a session, which is one of the very unique session on the bond markets, which is one of the emerging areas. And we have a very specialized speaker on bond markets uh, who will be there. And of course, the opening session will be conducted by our past chairman of Thane Brand, C.A. Shivbhagwan Asawa, sir on the uh, on the financial aspects uh, as a part of this uh, on the projects as well as the financial aspects of the market so it is a one day conference it will be held at uh, uh, rnes banquet hall the registration links are also available on the portal we have shared it and we'll keep sharing it so i request you all to kindly take the benefit and do join in number it's a 6 cpr program and uh, most importantly, we have tried to blend on an area-specific uh, conference like we had a real estate conclave a few days back. This being on a specific category of Penathon uh, centric to the financial topics of it. So I request all of you to kindly join in numbers. So without a further ado, I would now uh, like to introduce our speaker for today, T.A. Sushrut Chitave. Uh, Sushrut sir, do you want to check your... Uh, um, Mike, if it is working fine once, then I'll uh, hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Omkar. Is it working fine? Yes, it is absolutely working fine. I think our uh, team has requested you to make some uh, technical uh, submission before you conclude on the session today because they are not able to make you a co-host of the session. So you would be the host in the session. So the uh, recording of the session will be done and that will be with, uh, with your PC till the time it is switched over to somebody else. So before sir, you log off, in, in any event, if you are logging off, then kindly uh, let us know so that we will, they will be just switching it for better, I mean, ensuring that we don't lose on the recording. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for that botheration. Okay, sir, I'll uh, just quickly uh, give an introduction of yours and then I'll hand over the session to you so that we start in time. So, uh, friends, we have C.S. Sushurut Chitre, our uh, very own beloved speaker, I should say, because he has uh, been very graceful to Tane Branch. In, uh, recently, also, he had come for the bank branch audit in the month of March 2024. And again, he has graced us today with his uh, presence for a webinar on, uh, for the webinar on this forensic audit. So, to give a brief profile, Sushutta is a partner with uh, Mukundam Chidai and company Chartered Accountants. He holds a bachelor's degree in commerce and a Chartered Accountant, cost and management accountant and an LLB by qualification. Uh, his ranks across the various segments. So, sorry, I think somebody is. I request all the participants to kindly put their mics on mute, please. Yes, thank you so much. He holds uh, uh, meritorious ranks ranging from 2nd to 29th. So in various exams across various professional exams at the various professional levels. And therefore, of course, uh, there is a highly meritorious 
speaker obviously we know him very well so that's that's something very nice to see every time i see his rankings it it's something that reminds me that okay this is something that i've been far off from sushil sir has been has completed the certificate course on forensic accounting and fraud detection conducted by icai he has been a part of the group which has formulated the valuation standards issued by icai sushil sir was elected as the wirc member and was has served as a secretary to the regional council that is wirc He is member of the accounting and auditing committee of BCAS and member of sustainability reporting standards boards of ICA. He worked with as a member of banking and financial committee, Indian merchant chambers, and has been a member of the family business enterprise entrepreneurship council of the Maharashtra Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture. He is appointed as an independent director on two public companies. He has been recognized as one of the Forty leading alternative investment professionals in India under forty and uh, of the age by the Indian Association of Alternative Investment Funds. So with this, I welcome Sushut sir, and uh, and we are really thankful that you have uh, given your precious time for us. And I would now hand over to you to continue with the session. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you so much, Omkar, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, before i speak i can see in the participant list there are there are people who are very senior round and senior chartered accountants from thane so my regards to all of you and uh, i mean I take the next one or 20 minutes or so in terms of which i have been asked to speak on the topic of forensic audit so let me first uh, okay actually i'll have to share my screen omkar uh, host it says host has disabled participant screen sharing So, okay. Just one minute, sir. I okay, think okay, okay. now you are the host. Yeah, since I am the host, now I can. <laughs> yes. So sorry, I am logging off for a while, and I'll rejoin in some time. No, no issues. No issues. So I hope you can see uh, see the screen. I hope everyone can see the screen. so i mean the topic given to me is forensic audit and uh, just because forensic audit just as a topic can remain only boring i am just adding a topic saying uh, forensic audit just uh, say forensic audit opportunities for the future now what we are going to broadly cover in the next 1 hour 20 minutes is the topic of what is actually forensic audit and a number of other topics within that now forensic audit as a topic can remain always very interesting for the simple reason being that uh, we hear of so many cases happening uh, in terms of nowadays be it ed cbi sfio and a lot of things and we see a lot of things happening in terms of the kind of frauds or the kind of uh, uh, kind of scams that are typically detected or people getting arrested and uh, then we always have a concept where some chartered accountancy firm is generally appointed to do a forensic audit and at the end of the forensic audit uh, there is some kind of a conclusion which is drawn so first thing that i would like to very well clearly say that while the newspaper reports are always, always exciting in the reality uh, forensic audit is always a very specific and uh, i would say a very uh, detailed oriented exercise in terms of how one, one goes about really in terms of trying to do one's work having said that uh, we will start with the session so first most important thing to realize is that there is no specific definition of the word forensic audit a forensic audit as a term has actually originated more in terms of the colloquial language or more in terms of how the market has typically looked at it and uh, if you if you ask me uh, the current terminology which even the institute intends to use is what is called as forensic accounting and investigation standards because as we all know that the word audit has got a specific connotation under the assurance principles or under the various assurance uh, the the standards on auditing and in a audit typically we tend to give some kind of an assurance whereas forensic audit by the word per se we are actually doing more of fact finding and whatever we observe in terms of certain facts is what we really present in terms of a report so technically it is not really an audit in that sense and because of which the word used by the institute is forensic accounting and investigation standards so the institute in a way intends that we call it forensic accounting and investigation Uh, but the word forensic audit is something which has really stuck up in terms of how the market uses it and that's why i'm using the word forensic audit uh in common parlance what is forensic audit it is a gathering of evidence to establish any wrongdoing or fraud so here we need to also be very clear that in a forensic audit what is actually happening is that we are gathering evidence 
to establish whether there is any wrongdoing or fraud and we will we'll go to each of these elements as we go through the presentation because then the next bigger question comes what is fraud and then what is fraud is again like a definition which is different across various acts and we will see as it goes ahead it is most commonly used in the detection of fraud so wherever there is a fraud there is an intention that there is some kind of a forensic audit which is undertaken and that is where the principles are used now just to give a sense uh, we i have what i've tried to do is i have tried to look at the rbi annual report uh, for uh, 2022-23 and if you see these numbers you can see two charts there one is in terms of the fraud by value and second is the fraud by numbers so if you see the frauds by value have actually reduced in the past two years but the frauds in terms of numbers they have increased quite substantially now why have they actually reduced in terms of numbers because i think somewhere maybe two to three years back there was a great emphasis in terms of all banks trying to report a large number of old cases as fraud so that's why there was an increase in 2020 21 but thereafter it has in a way toned down a bit and if you see in terms of value again a larger share of frauds are typically reported by the public sector banks than as compared to the private sector banks and most of these frauds typically pertain to the loans in terms of the value component of it as far as the small value or if you go by the numbers per se in terms of number of frauds again if you see that the more number of frauds are actually being reported by private banks but these are mostly small value or internet frauds and which contribute maximum to the total number of frauds in private banks now if you for all of us who would be doing private or i mean any kind of bank audit we all know that there is a concept of a fmr1 re return that is a fraud monitoring return which every bank has to file with the rbi in respect of any fraud and any kind of fraud normally a bank typically classifies in terms of three categories one is the credit related frauds which is typically a loan fraud where somebody has taken away money and vanished or some kind of loan siphoning has happened second is typically an operational fraud where somebody who is actually involved in the bank in terms of a bank employee has done some fraud or there is some involvement of a bank official that is an operational fraud and third thing is nowadays what is the internet based fraud uh, so i think that is our credit card related frauds and these are frauds where typically a large number of uh, things can also happen so why i have tried to cover more so from a bank perspective because with respect to any uh, organization or today also if we see most of the frauds most of the frauds will always have a money in element involved to it and then when some money in event is involved typically it will be with respect to any kind of loan which is taken which is not repaid or some kind of a connection with the bank because of which uh, a fraud would typically happen now one more interesting thing is if you see that uh, out of the total frauds reported in 2022-23 uh, only 16% which is 4871 crores it pertained to 2022 or 2223 or 2122 now this is very interesting what it means is that whatever frauds were even reported in 22-23, if you see this uh, small chart that you see here, uh, now this also only 16% of it pertained to this year or the earlier years. And most of it pertained to the years prior to that. Now, I mean, all of us who are in bank audits or connected with banks, I think the answer to this is pretty obvious. What happens is RBI announced very clearly say that if an account is declared as a fraud, then the entire value of outstanding has to be provided for irrespective of whether there is a security or whether it is an NPA or not. Now, because of which typically in most banks, you will see that by the time an account is declared as a fraud, 100% provision is anyway held in respect of it. And because of which there is no real impact to the balance sheet. So I'm not trying to suggest anything, but the reality is this, that in most cases of frauds, which banks today declare, most of those frauds don't even pertain to that year. Typically they pertain to at least two, three years before that, by which the IRAC norms really kick in and to that extent there is no real impact as far as the balance sheet of the bank is concerned. Coming specifically to what is a fraud per se. Now what is a fraud I think is always a question of discussion because we tend to always go in terms of discussing about what is a fraud and uh, we have our own connotations in respect of saying something which is a fraud or this is a fraud but in reality when we look at it from a legal context it has to be always proved as a fraud in terms of the legal language of it. So somebody tomorrow as a court has to in a way prove or has to the whatever is being proved by the investigating authority has to stand as evidence in a court of law 
and the court should have enough ground to convict a person of a fraud. And to that extent, what becomes important is what is the actual definition of fraud from a legal perspective. So if we see that there are various definitions of the word fraud. Now, what are the various definitions in different acts? I think explanation to section 447, which talks about punishment for fraud, which is covered in the Companies Act 2013. Then we have the RBI Master Circular on Fraud dated 1st July 2015, which has been revised uh, up to 1st July 2017 in case of fraud classification and reporting. Then you have a report of the RBI Working Group of Information Security, Electronic Banking, Technology Management and Cyber Frauds. You have the explanation to Section 45 of the Insurance Act. Then you have the Criminal Procedure Code 1973 and Indian Penal Code 1860. And then you have Section 17 of the Indian Contract Act 1872. Now the CPC and the CRPC, that is the Criminal Procedure Code and the Indian Penal Code, typically do not really use the word fraud, but it uses the word fraudulently and dishonestly. And that are the words which are very broadly and generally defined. So if you see an interesting part here is that the word fraud has been defined even in the year 1872 when there was an Indian Contract Act. And it has been also de defined in the word 2013 when the Companies Act 2013 was enacted. So I think the word fraud or the concept of fraud is going to be prevalent in past or in future as what Chanakya has said. And from that concept, if you see the change in definitions, the definition in terms of what could be there in the Indian Contract Act 1872 is a smaller definition. But if we look at the whole definition of fraud in the Companies Act, it, that is a very wide definition, which we will talk about as we go ahead. And then there is obviously SA 240, which talks about auditors' responsibilities relating to fraud in the audit of financial statements. Coming specifically to fraud as a definition, as a definition in the Companies Act, it says that fraud in relation to the affairs of a company or a body corporate, it includes any act, any omission, any concealment of fact, or abuse of position committed by any person or any other person with the connivance in any manner, with the intent to deceive, to gain undue advantage from, or to injure the interests of the company, or its shareholders, or its creditors or any other person, whether or not there is any wrongful gain or wrongful loss. And here wrongful gain means the gain by unlawful means of property to which the person gaining is not legally entitled. And wrongful loss means the loss by unlawful means of property to which the person losing is legally not entitled. So if you see the definition, the definition is so wide that it covers not only acts of commission, it also covers acts of omission. And it is not really restricted only to the company or its shareholders. It takes into consideration the abuse of position also which is committed by a person by itself, by himself, or with the connivance, with the intent to deceive or to gain undue advantage from, or to injure the interests of company, shareholders, creditors, or any other person. So if you really look at it, the definition of fraud has been made very, very wide. And this is the change if you see from what is there probably in the Indian Contract Act 1870, as compared to what is there in the Companies Act 2013. If you look at fraud from the perspective of the Reserve Bank of India in terms of the 1st July circular on fraud classification and reporting, Reserve Bank per se does not anywhere define the word fraud at all. So Reserve Bank says that what can be frauds classified into. So it talks more in terms of the classification of frauds. And RBI has in a way based it mainly on the provisions of the Indian Penal Code. And then there are seven categories there. It talks about misappropriation and criminal breach of trust. Second is it could be fraudulent encashment through forged instruments or uh, through forged instruments, manipulation of books of accounts or through fictitious accounts and conversion of property. Unauthorized credit facilities extended for reward or for illegal gratification. Agents and cash shortages, cheating and forgery, irregularities in foreign exchange transactions and any other type of fraud not coming under the specific headers as above. Now, why am I really going through all this in detail? is for the simple reason that if tomorrow any one of us is appointed as a forensic auditor with respect to any, any by any bank, with respect to any kind of a borrower account, what we need to clearly keep in mind is that at the end of the day, the decision of whether that particular account is fraud, is a, it has to be declared as a fraud or not, is going to be dependent on your forensic audit report. And your forensic audit report also has to state some facts. But now that is where the interesting part begins. Indian Banks Association, through its <coughs> one of the circulars, 
has very clearly instructed all banks to say that a bank should accept a forensic audit report only if it's conclusive. And because of that reason, nowadays, most banks do not accept a forensic audit report unless the forensic audit report typically says whether there is a fraud or not. Now, the reality is that whether something is a fraud or not is in reality going to be determined by the court. But because your report itself is not going to be admitted or accepted, because of which you need to reach some kind of a conclusion whether there is a fraud or not. And that is where what practically we need to do is we need to practically fit our observations within either of these six categories because seven categories, any other type of fraud, which is difficult for an auditor to say that this can be called as a fraud, but it is not defined as such. But essentially, we need to fit any of our criteria or any of the observations that we observe with respect to a borrower company from a bank. Uh, we have to fit it within each of these or any of these seven criteria and based on which we can say that these are the grounds on which the bank can take a decision about classifying an account as a fraud or not. Because ultimately the responsibility of classifying any borrower account as a fraud or not rests on the bank. It is not really on the forensic auditor to determine whether it is a fraud. But nowadays because banks insist on a conclusive forensic audit report, we will have to finally say, okay, what can be a misappropriation or criminal breach of trust? It can be a simple thing that I go to a bank and I say that I want to have a loan for a particular purpose, but I've utilized the money for an entirely different purpose. Now, that is something which is a misappropriation or I would not use the word criminal because that has an intent, but at least there is a definite breach of trust. So that is one aspect. Now, fraudulent encashment through forced instruments is something which is nowadays not that common because that kind of frauds will be more at a retail level in terms of checks or something. Uh, second case is with respect to manipulation of books of accounts. I don't know if somebody is interested in drawing here or whatever. Anyway, forget it. Second is with respect to manipulation of books of accounts or through fictitious accounts. Now, manipulation of books of accounts could mean something like I have a stock statement or I have a stock balance of say 100 rupees. But when I actually submit my stock statements to the bank, I am saying that I have stock of at least 300 or 400 rupees. Now, that is something which can be called as manipulation of books of accounts. If you see, in fact, the Caro reporting, which has come into place maybe two years back, many of the points which are now required to be certified by the statutory auditors effectively are points which would have arisen from many forensic audit reports over the last four or five years. Because this kind of a topic or this kind of a comment was not really required with respect to any statutory auditor in the past. But now if you see Caro, Caro specifically requires that we state whether the stock statements submitted to the bank are agreeing with the books of accounts or not. Now, why did that arise? Is because in the past, when we used to do forensic audits, we used to realize this very commonly that the book, the stock statement as far as the books of accounts was concerned was much lower than what was being told to the bank. So I think that can be classified as manipulation of books of accounts. Unauthorized credit facilities extended for reward or for illegal gratification. Now, this is more on the bank side. Uh, to be very practical, no bank typically allows any forensic auditor to look at the functioning of the bank per se. So the entire scope of work is always restricted with respect to what the money has, what has happened to the money as far as the borrower end is concerned. This is more in terms of the vigilance angle as far as the bank end is concerned, which is handled by the bank internally. Negligence and cash shortages, cheating and forgery and irregularities in foreign exchange transactions are very specific items which are nor normally not found when uh, it, the matter goes to a forensic audit. So what point that I'm trying to say is that when we actually do a forensic audit, whatever observations we, we have will typically fall within misappropriation or breach of trust or it will fall within the category of manipulation of books of accounts. So I think this we need to be conversant because that is how our report will have to ultimately go uh, based on which the bank can either take a decision that something is a fraud or can take a decision that it is not a fraud. Going specifically to what are the types of frauds. So I think if you look at the Association of Certified Forensic Examiners, it talks about three broad categories of frauds. One is asset misappropriation. Second is corruption-oriented frauds. And third is misrepresentation of financial statements. Now, if we look at the specific items with respect to asset misappropriations, then there are a number of frauds which are common. So for what could these be? Skimming. Skimming is typically where you 
do not account for some cash that you have received uh, you something like teaming and leading you do not account for the cash and you use the cash and you account for the next level of cash so at every point of time there is always be a gap between the cash which is there in the books of accounts and the cash which is physically available cash larceny is typically where there are less kind of internal controls because of which money is accounted for it is received but thereafter somebody in a way takes away the cash fake bills uh, no need to explain here fake bills can be both on the sales side as well as the purchase side though obviously because of now gst and the number of reconciliation between gst and income tax and now because if you see a 26 as even the gst data to a large extent is seen there so because of this there are a large number of controls being built in because of which at least this can be easily identifiable or then at least there has to be a very clear logical explanation at least as far as the sale side is concerned but on the purchase side there could be situations in case of fake bills which are typically booked which are not both two things were where there is typically no real transaction at all or there is a uh, there there is a different kind of transaction which has been so the nature of transaction is changed or sometimes the transaction itself is not there so fake bills are there ghost employees again in terms of uh, certain cases where there are no real employees but a lot of people are shown on the rolls uh, typically at a level which can again not be reconciled because uh, if there is somebody i mean workers obviously then you have to reconcile the esic pf and all this kind of data but that is also one of the factors and expense reimbursement schemes which again could also be involved with respect to the approval limit so this could happen in large organizations where if i have a expense reimbursement uh, power of up to 15000 then i can ask people who are below me to make sure that they break the bills in such a way that all amounts up to 15000 are always approved and then i keep on approving all of them and then there could be a question of inventory misuse so if you look at all these kind of asset misappropriation schemes the common factor in all of these is that all of these can really insist when the internal controls in the organization are relatively weak at the same point of time if you look at these these are very operational kind of frauds so these are frauds which were typically happen at a retail level to use the word where somebody for example in a store or somebody at a counter can do these kind of frauds but the monetary impact of it is not going to be too significant for the organization unless this is pervasive in nature the second kind of fraud category is more in terms of corruption or bribery i don't need to explain but yeah that is also a uh, thing kickbacks uh, bid rigging is also like a major kind of fraud in a sense where the qualification or the pre qualification criteria in most of the tenders are done in such a way that a very few category of people are selected because of which the organization indirectly ends up paying maybe twice or thrice what they would be paying or what even those same competitors might be charging to other parties and uh, that is how that bit and money laundering which is like we nowadays read a lot about this word money laundering especially from a ed perspective but yeah money laundering is something which is again uh, connected with the whole thing there can be a separate discussion on this topic per se but in simple words it is a question of basically money which is ill gotten through illegal means which is in a way converted into some kind of a system by which it enters the formal economy that is in a loose sense the whole definition of money laundering these are again corruption oriented frauds i mean uh, everything in this yellow category in uh, between these are all categories which are all types of frauds where typically person who is in a position of authority misuses that authority or abuses the position because of which these kind of frauds can really happen the third category is essentially fictitious revenue booking or these are typically financial statements oriented frauds and these could involve say fictitious revenue bookings uh, non provision of certain losses uh, or incorrect asset valuations typically in a india india's concept and siphoning of bank loans and shifting of profits to shell companies now if you look at any of these kind of categories the important point if you see in all these five categories is that these are all very very high ended type of frauds where basically you will see that the nature of fraud is such that the amounts involved will always be significantly higher at the same point of time the people who can conduct these kind of frauds will be always people in a position of authority because fictitious revenue booking is not something which can be done by the person who is actually passing the revenue entry it is always going to be done by somebody who has got an incentive in 
ensuring that their revenues are higher or low. So from that point of view, asset misappropriation frauds, if you see on the left side, these are all frauds which are conducted by people who may have a direct interest in that fraud. But typically, these are category of people who would be at a retail level or at a store level where the value of the fraud is less. Whereas the frauds which pertain to financial statements always are of a category where more often than not, the senior management is bound to be involved because they would typically benefit the most in terms of these kind of frauds. So some of the financial statement frauds could be inflating sales. Now, this could happen through dummy sales especially on the high C or some kind of circular transactions where A sells to B, B sells to A. Now, we need to also be careful that it is not necessary that all kind of high C sales are frauds. But we need to be, if you are especially a forensic auditor or a statutory auditor, one has to be very careful in terms of if a company has got a very large chunk of high C sales, wherein basically something which is a ship which is coming, say, from a foreign country and which is beyond the Indian uh, beyond certain numbers of the Indian nautical miles, so basically in the international waters. And if there are just transfer of sh goods happening because of changing of uh, handing uh, or a bill of lading, I think in such kind of a situation, there is no GST applicable, there is nothing applicable. So one has to be a bit careful in terms of if a large portion of such kind of sales of a company are, ha are happening only in respect of IC sales. So it's not to suggest that all IC sales are frauds, but one has to be a bit careful. Then there could be sale and leaseback transactions where typically in a sale and leaseback, you could see these transactions more in terms of say in an airline industry where the person or the company which buys an aeroplane today in India does not really own the aeroplane as far as the books of accounts are concerned. So typically it enters then into a financing arrangement where it sells the plane technically to a financer and then it leases it back. Now, because the nature of the transaction is primarily a one of financing, uh, it can easily be possible that you actually sell at a much higher price and then you lease back at a higher price, which is going to be effectively paid over the next five years, 10 years, as the case may be. Now, this is technically not really a fraud in that sense, because provided it is allowed by the accounting standards and index, to that extent, it can result into some change as far as the profitability of the company is concerned for those relevant years. But this is, again, one thing where we have to be careful in terms of whether it is resulting into an inflated position as far as the balance sheet is concerned. Here in sales is like a typical and obvious thing in terms of sales of a company which are entered into towards the year end. We have to be very careful in terms of the cutoffs, whether that is properly taken care of or not. Next is in case of sale on return basis. Now, this is typically the norm in case of most companies in the retail segment, especially in case of malls or any of the clients which sell in any malls. While the companies will always end up accounting it as and when the when the when the goods are dispatched, in reality, the arrangement in most of these cases would be that the money will be received only when that product is actually sold from the moon. So, from that perspective, one has to be a bit cautious in terms of the volume of what is really happening to ensure that you are not really inflating sales. From points movements perspective, one has to be careful with respect to loans or advances to related unrelated companies. So when we say related unrelated companies, means companies which are technically related, but companies which on the face of it uh, may not really be, uh, I mean, from a standards, accounting standards perspective or companies act perspective, maybe they are not related parties, but in reality, in, 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 uh, in reality they are actually related uh, in, in terms of the control that is vested. Second is purchases or sales to overseas affiliated entities. Now, again, this is, again, what I'm trying to say in all of these are not all of these are necessarily frauds, but these are all cases where there should be some kind of a, I would not say a red flag, but at least an orange flag, which goes up in one side in terms of trying to understand whether there is any kind of a movement which is happening of funds or profits which can result into this kind of thing. So purchase or sales to overseas affiliated entities could mean that suppose you are buying a machinery from Germany, but then you don't directly buy the machinery from Germany. You buy a machinery from an intermediary in say uh, uh, Dubai, in which case effectively you need to see what is the price at which you German company in a way sold to the Dubai company. So to what extent are you in a way shifting some of the purchase cost to Dubai? So that is something which one has to really look for if you are doing a forensic audit. Otherwise, if from a statutory audit, there are different connotations. 
then loan against pledge of shares in case of listed companies is again one parameter coming to money laundering again i mean i don't want to go into the whole concept of money laundering here but more so what are the key steps or what is really done so one is the part of the structuring where cash is broken into smaller deposits to avoid suspicion and reporting because now you have the under pmla uh, you have a detailed system and we'll cover that but there is a detailed system of there is a body called as a financial intelligence unit and all banks and now i think all of us also technically are now covered wherever under certain criteria if chartered accountants are also handling money for any of their clients i mean even we are technically reporting entities so we need to report on the fir to the fiu with respect to various aspects uh, be with respect to there are various types of reports so basically in any kind of a money laundering the primary thing is the structuring part and structuring here is essentially cash which is broken up into smaller deposits to avoid suspicion and reporting then there could be cash which is smuggled and deposited in jurisdictions with banking secrecy and lower oversight uh, even today there are many jurisdictions across the world where you can actually go and uh, now obviously this is reducing a bit but still there are jurisdictions where you can even withdraw uh, maybe a lot of dollars without any question asked with respect to what are you using the money for or any such purpose no all of this is typically i mean need not really explain to cas here but uh, typically this is more so is the case in case of any cash intensive businesses which could involve a chain of hotels or restaurants or retail stores or casinos or petrol pumps where by definition there is going to be a lot of cash which could be generated now thankfully in india because of the whole post covid and because of covid or after covid because of the huge eminence of upi now even this thing is going down because from the demand side itself people are now insisting in terms of paying through upi or paying through credit cards or through bank transfers so to that extent now this will reduce but otherwise these are typically businesses which are typically cash in intensive and this can result into some kind of a money laundering activity like we discussed earlier there could be trade through trade it could happen through over invoicing of purchases that is moving money out of the country or it could also happen through under invoicing sales to related party based in a foreign jurisdiction which you are actually shifting profits to another country suppose you are exporting to africa then you always have a uh, typical uh, subsidiary in dubai or uae or any of the free trade zones there and then there could be a shifting of profits to dubai and from there the sale could happen in uh, the african market now what i am again trying to say is that not all of this is always a fraud but one has to it has to always fit in within the regulations because now you also have transfer pricing regulations and a lot of other things so subject to that uh, all these things can uh, typically happen then there could be shell companies or khoka companies which are used to root funds at the end of this presentation i have tried to give a example in one of the case studies that we had encountered in terms of what was being done there Uh, obviously we've seen the word shell company coca companies to be frank no law today exists which defines this word so to my knowledge there is no definition of the word shell companies or coca companies but i think as chartered accountants we really all of us know what typically a shell company or a coca company is then there could be round tripping where again money is shifted outside the country then deposits in a bank account in a tax haven routed through various countries and enters the country as an fdi uh this could be one of the effects of money laundering and then last which is theoretical and to my knowledge i have not seen it directly in a indian context but there could be a concept of a bank capture itself where what happens is that there is a money which is deposited in a bank this could be money which typically belongs to a ponzi scheme where large amounts of money are collected now with that uh, the typical people could get control of a bank now this could be mostly cooperative banks or it could be foreign banks in jurisdictions with lower banking controls but cooperative banks because it is again people can vote depending on number of elected and if in a smaller bank of say 100 crore deposits if you suddenly decide to put 1000 crores then to that extent there could be a possibility of more number of directors that you can get elected to the bank and then based on that you get a control of the bank per se considering the large quantum of money deposited and with that then you effectively transfer money to related parties at loans through banking system now this is more theoretical i am not aware directly of a indian context where this has happened but essentially in a banking system the important part is once a deposit comes into the bank 
the 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 link between who is the depositor and to whom the loan is given is completely broken and to that extent this could be a facility which may be used uh, or which might have been used in terms of uh, uh, some kind of a money laundering activity as far as what i said about the fiu in terms of the financial intelligence unit there are various kinds of reports which are required to be provided by all reporting entities and like i said even chartered accountants who fit within the criteria which are prescribed under that circular are also required to be reporting entities now there are various kinds of reports which are required to be given and i think for all of us connected with the bank audits or some kind of banking in any way we all know that uh, there is detailed reporting to the fiu by every bank uh, there are five types of reports which are typically given one is the suspicious transaction report which is called as strs now strs typically would mean any kind of situations where suddenly a person puts in a large amount of cash and immediately on next day uh, a big credit card payment is done or large amount of cash and immediately that is used as a remittance to a third party so anywhere where a banking system is being used to flush in funds and flush out funds now those are required to be uh, reported by the bank to the fiu similarly cash transaction report so any kind of cash deposit i think about 10 lakhs but any kind of cash deposit above a particular amount has to be immediately reported to the fius then there are counterfeit currency reports so any kind of counterfeiting in terms of the currency which is received uh, fake notes or these kind of things uh, those are also required to be received uh, hey. then there are cross border wire transfers so any kind of cross border wire transfers if they are happening those need to be reported and then there are certain criteria with respect to especially in case of npos or ngos now what i have tried to give here is the total volume of such reporting for the year 22 23 this is based on the fiu annual report for 22 23 if you real if you look at these numbers these numbers are so humongous you can imagine 149.9 lakh ctr so this is not the value the value could be into i don't know maybe hundreds or thousands of crores this is the number of reports which were reported by the bank uh, as far as uh, or by a number of reporting entities to the fiu in that year so you can imagine the job role of these kind of agencies and i don't know to what extent would they be in up even in a position to sort of analyze this and take this kind of a decision but the important point is all this data if need be is very readily available with the fiu at one level at one place if they need to or they wish to analyze or understand anything so next is i have just tried to look through there is in 2024 recently this association for certified fraud examiners every year they issue what is called as a report to the nations now this is a survey this is a survey of all forensic auditors or fraud examiners working across various countries and there are only two or three broad points which i thought is very interesting which i thought i'll cover here so how much really fraud how much does fraud really cost so we looked at asset misappropriation schemes we looked at corruption and we looked at financial statement fraud and we see that asset misappropriation schemes are the most common in terms of number of cases but they obviously cost the least whereas financial statement frauds are least common in terms of the number of cases but the average value of each case or the loss caused due to each case is always going to be substantially high and that's something that we need to keep at the back of the mind when we are approaching this topic next is about how is actually fraud detected because we always have a fair sense of belief that everything in a way or a lot of frauds are caught because of some forensic auditors and all the reality is always different the reality is that 43% of frauds are detected by whistle blowers using various means like fraud hotline emails or through unsigned letters sent through post so if you look at again this survey it says that 43% so practically half the frauds half the frauds are reported because of a tip which is given to the people who are concerned and out of these half if you see who reports these 50% of this is again reported by the employees themselves now this could again be in two categories somebody who effectively felt that something is wrong has to report is one category the other category unfortunately could be somebody who knows what is happening but is not taken as a part of that fraud so i think in both these categories is where typically people tend to give a tip normally when a specific tip is received that also makes the job of doing a forensic audit reasonably easy because then you exactly know what you need to look at 
because otherwise trying to find out what fraud is happening if you don't have a sense of what has happened is always going to be quite dif uh, difficult the second category is also customer because many a times if a customer comes to know of certain kind of a fraud a customer at a cultural level or at a philosophical level always wants to have good relationship also with the uh, vendor and accordingly it is very fair that most customers would then in that case try and talk to somebody very senior in the vendor and say that oh this is something that could be happening in your organization so kindly really look at that in recent years because now this whole whistleblower mechanism has uh, caught up pace and because most companies and most even government systems have now very detailed whistleblower mechanisms implemented uh, because of which there are now anonymous complaints which are also received but to be fair the nature of most anonymous complaints makes it very apparent that it is somebody who is an insider who is really making an anonymous complaint because the kind of details that are provided would really not be available to somebody who is completely outside so i think that's something which one has to also keep at the back of the mind that most frauds almost half the frauds are typically tips which are really re received by the organization in terms of what exactly is going on the next paragraph or the next sorry the next uh, 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 image is essentially in trying to figure out that what kind of organizations get affected by fraud so if you see by number you will see that in case of percentage of cases or by number of cases it is not only that government and public companies are affected by frauds it is actually that private companies are also equally affected by frauds what happens in a indian context in case of say government companies is that there are so many regulators uh, because of which the possibility of a fraud being caught are frankly a bit higher because you always have an internal vigilance system the cvc looking at things you have at a state level an anti corruption bureau you also have the cbi in case of central government employees and like i said for everything in case of most psus there is a vigilance unit which is really looking through a <clears throat> magnifying glass in terms of every transaction in terms of what is entered now obviously there are different ways by which people try and circumvent that but the important point is in case of most government and public sector companies the possibility of a fraud being detected are actually to that extent a bit higher because of so many uh, connected uh, investigative agencies in case of private sector it is not that frauds don't happen frauds also happen to equal in number of uh, cases and that is what this image in a way tries to highlight coming to the difference between say a forensic audit and a statutory audit the importance and i think that is where we need to be very careful because uh, in a statutory audit our role is typically to express an opinion uh, as to the true and fair presentation of financial statements whereas in case of a forensic audit our specific purpose is to identify and uncover a wrongdoing so in a forensic audit we know that there could be a allegation or there could be an assessment that something is wrong and the entire focus is in terms of trying to understand exactly what has gone wrong whereas in a statutory audit we are generally trying to say that whether everything is true and fair or so the mindset in case of a statutory audit is more in terms of trust but verify whereas in case of forensic audit is always to presuppose wrong way now that is where again a mindset change is required because in a statutory audit you don't start a statutory audit presuming that everything is wrong because otherwise doing an audit will become very difficult because you will have to practically do a 100% substantive check of all transactions and which for a larger organization is practically impossible but in a forensic audit you have to presuppose that something is wrong and why is it necessary because that is the whole reason why you are appointed because nobody is going to appoint a forensic auditor to just say ki ek bar jara forensic audit karke dekho dekho kuch nahi milta hai kya as that that really doesn't happen there is always there is some sense of something being wrong in some person or some department or some location and that is where uh, on the basis of such kind of a presupposition is that a forensic auditor is typically appointed to then look into more detail in terms of trying to see what has actually happened in terms of the techniques as far as the audit is concerned for a statutory audit <clears throat> these are typically substantive and compliance or sample based whereas in case of in forensic audit it is investigative it is substantive but it is in depth it is not sample based it has to be in depth so typically in case of a statutory audit you will normally be working wide whereas in case of forensic audit typically the approach is to go deep 
as far as verification of items of financial statements are concerned in a statutory audit we rely on management certificate or management representation obviously we don't only rely on that but we we carry out our other procedures but also rely to some extent whereas in case of forensic audit there is an independent verification of suspected or selected items where misappropriation is suspected uh, because the presupposition is that that the financial statements are not correct and based on which a necessary approach has to be undertaken uh, most importantly in case of a statutory audit the focus is on identification and disclosure and true and fair whereas in case of forensic audit the focus is on propriety and impact so it is very much possible that in a forensic audit the accounts might show effectively a true and fair position but still there could be some fraud of some means so the focus is primarily in terms of propriety whether something which should not have been done whether it has happened uh, so that is an angle which normally in a statutory audit we will not cover in terms of the propriety of things whether something is right or wrong unless something is illegal that's a different story but something which is a uh, propriety angle like how a cag looks at it typically we will not do when we are doing a statutory audit but in a forensic audit we are supposed to look at a propriety and the impact thereof as far as the report or adverse findings are concerned in a statutory audit or negative opinion or qualified opinion we give which is expressed with or without a qualification in case of a forensic audit i think the outlook because one thing is very clear a forensic audit report cannot look like a newspaper report it can i'll give you an example it can only damage everyone so in a forensic audit report we have to be very precise in terms of legal determination of the fraud impact because if you are coming to a conclusion that there is something which is a problem there has to be a legal definition of what you have we have identified in terms of whether what legal name it can be categorized it and identification again of the people who could be depend who could who could have perpetrated because just trying to say at the end of the day ki yes 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 this is a fraud and these are the reasons why it is a fraud now that is one item of it but the next item is okay if this is a fraud then who needs to be punished so then it has to go a bit beyond that and try and explain in terms of who could be the possible perpetrators who are actually involved as far as the fraud is concerned coming specifically to the types of forensic audit uh, assignments or engagements or types of uh, areas where we can work now one kind of area is where frauds are carried out by employees against their organizations and this is frankly a very large emerging area as far as an opportunity for forensic auditors is concerned uh, again like i said that frauds necessarily don't happen only in public sector entities they equally happen for private sector entities and uh, now we are also seeing it in uh, i can say more often because of a number of reasons because now and we'll cover that towards the end because now even auditors are report fraud not only to the central government uh, but also sometimes in the board's report plus listed companies are now supposed to report frauds to the exchange as soon as they come to know of it so because of a lot of these reasons now there are more examples of frauds which are actually coming out into the open and in most of these cases the companies tend to appoint forensic auditors to undertake a forensic audit to find out what has exactly happened now these kind of forensic audits are not only financial audits and i think i let me pause here for a second and try and say a few words here that all of us come from a maybe from a chartered accountancy background so we are experts in terms of trying to understand where the money has gone and what could be the driver for a lot of things at the same point of time what is it that could have happened but we are typically getting looking at it from a financial angle but nowadays if you see most of the transactions typically tend to happen online it could be through mobile phones most communication is through mobile phones it could be through your computers it could be through the office servers and accordingly a necessary part of the team is also required to have people who have got adequate technical background and the necessary tools whereby if you are appointed to do this kind of a work you have a set of team members who can actually go who can take the mobile phone of the person who is suspected along with the laptop and have tools by which the complete backup in terms of there are many tools available because of which the entire i would say indexation with respect to all conversations is also done and which you can then analyze so the point that i am trying to make is that if this kind of assignment is to be undertaken it is no longer only about trying to look at 
what that person has done in terms of his or her bank statements or family members' bank statements, but essentially a comprehensive analysis across various domains in terms of skill sets are necessary to bring to the table in terms of trying to take it to the logical end. Now, obviously, for this kind of a suspected fraud, employees, because of many a times the terms of their employment as well as the policies of the organization are duty bound to actually cooperate completely. So that is where, frankly, doing this job is to some extent relatively easy because a person cannot really, uh, for example, in all organizations, the laptop is always going to be owned by the organization. So it is practically impossible for an employee to say that I will not hand over the laptop or sometimes even the mobile phone because some organizations already have policies to that extent. So to that extent, at least finding out what has happened becomes relatively easier. Second, which is, I think, the most prevalent and frankly speaking, most prevalent uh, type of forensic audit is in case of NPA cases, because now as per RBI rules, any fraud which is more than 50 crores typically has to, if there is an NPA, the bank is supposed to look at a possibility of fraud and siphoning and accordingly a forensic auditor is always appointed. So NPA cases where money lent by banks is not, bankers is not repaid by borrowers. Though I must need to say here that it is not necessary that I mean, bank, uh, the Reserve Bank per se does not anywhere link fraud with NPA. So Reserve Bank, if you see the master direction on frauds, it very clearly says that anything which is a fraud has to be fully provided. It does not really link it to NPA. But it is it is common sense that, I mean, which banker will try and get into an assessment of fraud if the, if the borrowings are, I mean, if, if the account is standard. So to that extent, NPA typically when it is an NPA of more than 50 crores, uh, again, RBI requires that in such cases, everywhere the forensic audit angle, the, the fraud investigation angle has to be verified. So that is where the forensic audit is appointed. Third is in case of Ponzi schemes. Typically, Ponzi scheme is a situation where you take money from A, uh, pay B, take money from B, pay C, take money from C, pay A, and then you keep on routing the cycle over a period of time. At some point of time, the cycle is bound to break at which point of time a lot of people have lost money. Now, in this case, typically it is a government through the economic offenses wing of the various districts. So, Mumbai has a different economic offense wing for Mumbai police. Thane has a different under Thane police commissionerate. The economic offense wing is separate. So, they have there is a registration in terms of impanelment at the government of Maharashtra level. And through which these kind of assignments are typically given out to forensic auditors. So, Ponzi schemes is again one area where the investigative agency will typically appoint a, a forensic auditor. Disproportionate asset cases, again, with respect to, uh, I would say, uh, any kind of public servants, where, again, the Anti-Corruption Bureau or CBI would typically, Anti-Corruption Bureau in any state covers all state government employees and public servants within the state, whereas CBI has got normal jurisdiction with respect to all central government employees, public sector banks, as well as central government public servants. So these cases are typically handled by under the Anti-Corruption Bureau of, say, Maharashtra or the CBI. And from that perspective, this kind of assignments are given where they have an internal formula in terms of how to calculate disproportionate assets. And that's how these assignments are done. Terrorism-related money trail cases, these are typically assignments given out by NIA, National Investigation Agency, which also has an impanelment process. And based on which, essentially, here the focus is to identify the money trail, where money has actually gone. Uh, that is what they focus on. Another area where I think, again, there is no impanelment per se, but where an important part of forensic audit comes to the play is transaction audit under IBC. So we all know that any time that a company goes into insolvency, typically an insolvency professional is appointed and then the insolvency professional has to undertake a transaction audit. Again, it is the insolvency professional or the resolution professional who needs to come to a judgment in terms of the transactions. And then there are four types of transactions within the IBC framework in terms of uh, extortionate transactions or fraudulent transactions or preferential transactions uh, or undervalued transactions. And I think the look back period in respect of the other three is only two years, but for fraudulent transactions, there is no limit in terms of how much years to go back. So I think that is where this aspect of forensic audit for frauds as well as the other transactions comes into play. Uh, for IBC, frankly, there is no concept of impanelment, frankly. It is up to the resolution professional to appoint a firm which can then give a report based on which the resolution professional can come to a judgment about whether there is any.
actions which has actually happened. Then there is forensic due diligence. Now this is only like a new product which is there, but essentially it is like any kind of new investment which is happening in a company by a private equity venture capital fund or any kind of a MA activity. Due diligence is a normal process, but along with due diligence, a forensic due diligence tries to understand or go into more detail in terms of the quality of suppliers or the market reputation or some kind of market diligence in terms of understanding the reputation of the people involved. So that is again one area which can be catered to. All the other things that I spoke till now are essentially post facto events. So typically after a situation has arisen or has been completed, you typically get into and try and find out what has happened. Fraud risk assessment is like more from an internal audit or more so from a pre facto basis where we try and understand what could be the various kind of fraud risks which are there within our organization and then what kind of controls can be enabled to possibly detect and prevent these kind of frauds. So this is more so in terms of a product offering or a service offering that can be provided along with internal audit wherever we are doing that work so that <clears throat> the client is protected in terms of any kind of such kind of events. So what are the skills which could be involved while doing any kind of a forensic audit? So I think fundamentally we as shattered accountants are uniquely, I would not say gifted, but we have a two or three major advantages that I think we'll have and we'll cover this is that we have excellent accounting knowledge. And I think many a times we all need to be very clear when we do a forensic audit that we tend to keep our disclosure hat aside. And uh, because one of the common things that when we start doing a forensic audit is that we say ki, Are ye to, this should have been disclosed as a related point. But frankly, not disclosing it as a related party does not make it a fraud. So we need to not focus too much on the disclosure per se. We need to go and then the substance of the transaction to understand what has exactly happened. So I think that is where core accounting knowledge that we have really comes to the fore. Secondly, nowadays, because we are using enormous amounts of data. Now, for example, even a simple case like a simple as a common case of say a Ponzi scheme in terms of a person who has defrauded a few people or nowadays few people will also translate into crores of rupees. So because the number of transactions are going to be so voluminous, nowadays it is not possible to manually or visually do any kind of uh, or to get to any kind of a conclusion. So because of which maybe it could be high-end Excel in terms of visual basic or um, it could be access or there could be specialized software like say an idea which uh, say we use but which can uh, analyze to say 10 crore line items at one point of time. So I think necessary skills need to be built up within the team uh, to be able to actually use these products. But let me also tell you equally, none of these products are something which are like a turnkey. So for example, if you even install an idea, you will need to spend quite a good amount of time in terms of understanding what and how to use it. And finally, like with any other, any, any software for that matter, it is only as good as what you exactly want to do out of it. So only if we are very clear in terms of what is it that we wish to use the product or that for that or that software for and if we are very then that particular software is going to be uh, sensible in terms of usage but yes there are softwares which are important and frankly speaking i mean if you start using this software the benefits are not only for forensic audit like uh, i can tell you for a bank up to maybe uh, say 16 to 17000 crores in advances we use idea now to practically do 100% audit. So we have now developed a tool internally as a part which can look at the standard asset or basically the NPA calculation for the whole bank. We are now able to use this software to do it, which runs into at least 20 lakh line items. Now that is also an advantage because from an auditing sense, and I'm digressing this a bit, but now when we do a statutory audit, because we are now able to use software, we are practically not in that particular bank. We are not really doing any sample testing at all. We are doing 100% audit because we are able to use the use that particular tool on the whole bank data itself. So point is that if we are able to use these products or use these tools efficiently, that is definitely going to add a lot of, I would say even time saving and more importantly in today's age comfort to the conclusion that we are able to draw, not only in forensic audit, but frankly, to even 
normal statutory audit and definitely even to internal audit that we do. Then creating and testing an hypothesis in case of a forensic audit, because like I said, in case of statutory audit, we typically go wide. Whereas in forensic audit, we tend to go deep in terms of trying to find out where could be a possible problem be and what could be the reason for that particular problem. So creating and testing this hypothesis is very important. That is the ability to think like a fraudster. Because if I was doing this fraud, what is it that I would have done if I am able to think through that? Then there is a fair possibility that I'm actually diving at the right location. Otherwise, I might be doing 100 dives, but all driving at a long location and not finding anything. So first and most important thing is ki if I was to do this fraud, what is it that I would have done? Because then I can test whether something like that has happened. Next is sound knowledge of various laws. And uh, this includes obviously banking laws if you are doing it on behalf of a bank. But even otherwise, you need to have a fair sense of banking laws, PMLA to some extent. MPID, especially in Maharashtra, there is a law called the Maharashtra Protection of Interest of Depositors Act, which is a very simple law, very small, very small law, which says that if a person borrows any law, sorry, borrows any money, and if the person does not repay, the person has to be, person is guilty. Guilty as in the person can be charged. And then the person has to really tell the court what is the money taken. And how is the person supposed to repay the money? And only if he is able to repay, then typically he is given a bail whenever he is caught. So MPID and obviously then it tends to exclude say banks or such kind of NBFCs, which, uh, which are definitely regulated by RBI or say, say BIRDA from such kind of uh, situations. But this is a simple law. And most cases, if you see, if you see an economic offense being pursuing any kind of an offense in Maharashtra, typically you will always see some clause of MPID being applied. Uh, Prevention of Corruption Act in case of, like I said, disproportionate asset cases and there could be case laws in case of various, one interesting case law is pertaining to Jailalita, uh, who was actually convicted of uh, disproportionate assets, assets after her death. And uh, this is a case in income tax uh, by the Supreme Court. And uh, that is a very interesting case law to read. Uh, but I mean, the point that I'm trying to ma make is that we have to have a sound knowledge of various laws. Why? Because it is, we are not writing a newspaper article. We are finally writing a forensic audit report, which can at least help the assist, uh, investigating officer. Uh, so there are two positions, two categories. One is that your client could be a private organization, in which case the private organization should conclusively know what has happened. And then... The choice is typically of the organization whether to pursue it from a criminal angle or to ask the necessary person to repay the money and leave. These are two practical possibilities. But in case if your client is an investigative authority like the UOW or Anti-Corruption Bureau or a CBI or a NIA or a SFIO, then there is no question of just repaying the money and not doing because irrespective of the value of fraud, the investigating agency is supposed to file a charge sheet. To file a charge sheet, they need to prove the fraud or prove the offense under some provision of law. And that's why that understanding of that necessary provision of law is necessary so that we can write the report in respect of the specific angles of the law which get offended or I mean which get contravened uh, because of which that particular situation arises. Next is understanding the business, which is critical. And I think, like I said, why chartered accountants are uniquely placed uh, for the simple reason is that we have good accounting knowledge. Secondly, we have fairly good sense of various laws. And we are unique people because, because of the other experience that we have, we have a fairly good sense of understanding various business activities. So the commercial sense of a transaction, I have seen chartered accountants tend to have, which is way better than uh, some other professionals. And to that extent, I think we are uniquely placed to be able to provide this kind of services, provided uh, we are able to bring in the right technology skill sets, technology as analytical skill sets in terms of uh, the nature of what we do. And most importantly, I think what is, what is important is common sense, because sometimes it is also necessary to forget that we are chartered accountants so that we keep on don't think of in terms of which provision of income tax act or which provision of accounting standards the person has contravened because that is not really the focus. The person, if the person has really run away with 100 crores, uh, 
some 43 b or some accounting standard 21 not contravened is frankly the least of the problems for even the investigative agency so we need to also keep on focusing on the key concept of what we are looking at and from that um, from that perspective common sense becomes most important so what should we do if we are really gearing up for a forensic audit so i think first is important is to understand the case background most importantly, see, nobody, like I said, nobody just comes to us and says, okay, ek bar ek forensic audit karke dekhte. unless there is a very specific reason in terms of very specific, uh, I can say, uh, situation in terms of presuming that there is something which is fundamentally wrong, unless that is there, nobody really undertakes a forensic audit in that case. So understanding the case background in terms of why a situation has actually reached a forensic audit stage is the first thing to understand, as in why is your client even appointing you? And at the end of it, what is it that the client only also expects you to uh, do or expects you to find out? Second is, what is the exact allegation? So in case of it being an investigative agency, you will typically have access to the FIR, which is lodged in case of a private organization. The private organization will normally give you a complete briefing in terms of what is it that they really suspect has actually happened. Next is understanding the end result, which is expected by the client. Now here, as I said, there are two possibilities. One is they wish to pursue it in a court of law, in which case whatever you find out has to be evidence which stands as evidence in the court of law. And then there could be another situation where they just want to generally understand what has gone wrong, in which case your focus can be a bit different. Next is in case of basic understanding of the target entity or people and reading all relevant laws, rules, processes, creating an hypothesis, and obtaining all necessary information. And like I said, again, nowadays when doing a forensic audit, depending on the nature of clients who has appointed you, actually your role and your rights, as well as what you can really do, changes quite substantially. If you are appointed by the organization who is suspecting a possible problem by one of the employees, you have practically every access. You have access to the organization, you have access to the uh, employee, you have access to the tools which are used by the employee, so you can do completely. If you are appointed by a bank, typically the borrower has to give access because otherwise the borrower can be called as a willful defaulter or a non-cooperative borrower and that has got other implications. So having said that, the borrower tends to cooperate. But if you go to the borrower and say, give me your mobile phone, the first thing that he'll go is to go to the court and say, which power give, which, which is the power given to the bank to ask for my mobile phone. So in case of typically a fraud investigation on behalf of a bank, there is a limited ability to go through the systems of the borrower per se, but it can be restricted to essentially the statements or the bank, the books of accounts as well as the bank statements of the borrower. If you're doing any kind of work on behalf of an investigative agency, like a central investigative agency, frankly, you have got a lot of access because in that case, you can get not only uh, the actual details of the borrower, but sometimes you can also get possibly all bank accounts linked to that PAN number, or you can also get other data that you ask for because of the relevant powers of that central investigative agency by law to get all that data. Suppose you're working for behalf of SEBI, you can practically get any market data, be it on NAC, BSE, NSDL, CDSL, any broker with respect to any transaction of a particular PAN at the click of a button that is available. But if you are at the same time doing it on behalf of a state investigative agency, then typical powers which are today available to an ED or a CBI are not available to a ACB, Anti-Corruption Bureau. So that's a different story. So in that case, what you get in terms of ready availability of information can change. Over a period of time, you might be able to get the whole information. So I think what you need to get is also something for you to clearly understand. And based on that, you need to clearly assess whether it is only financial part that you are going to look at or whether the technology part in terms of data backup, mobile phone imaging, email servers, or server backups, or these kind of analysis also needs to be done. So that has to be discussed with your client. And accordingly, whatever has, whatever I would say is best suited to meet the requirements of what they wish to lead to, I think accordingly, a, a plan needs to be designed. Next is testing the hypothesis. This will involve various analysis. Now this is on the technical side in case of analytical and substantive checks. There could be search words on the hard disk phone, mobile phones or emails. And the 
the essential part of this is that there has to be more focus rather than completeness because in case of statutory audit we tend to do that okay we have seen a bit of everything whereas here it is not necessary to see everything it is it is important that once we identify that there is a particular problem it is important to go deep into it and identify exactly what has happened uh, based on which i think you can reach a reasonably good conclusion and again substance over form is very important uh, because finally you need to go to the bottom of it to understand what is there gathering evidence now evidence i'm sure all of us know that evidence there is a separate law is the indian evidence act and evidence in a different form is it's interesting now when i was actually just to give an example i was working with an investigative agency and commercially or i would say uh, commonly uh, when we talk about things in our parlance it is very different so for example i am sushrut mukund chitre and if i do a google search or if i do a company law search and i see that okay there is a director called mukund manohar chitre are ha ye to uska hi beta hai he is his son so ha prove ho gaya now frankly commercially or when we commonly say these things it is it is fine because we quickly add up 2 and 2 and say it's 4 and ha okay chalo it is proved but in reality in a court of law you have to prove that sushrut mukund chitre is actually the son of mukund manohar chitre and you have to also prove that this sushrut mukund chitre is actually the son of the same mukund manohar chitre that you are speaking of. so just because you see it on a name and because you know that the name matches it doesn't really become a evidence and that is i think somewhere where we need to also go the extra mile in terms of trying to understand how the word evidence is actually construed in the court and that is where we need to go the extra mile to be able to draw evidence in such a manner which can stand as evidence in a court of law and last thing is again writing a report writing a report is i think like i said at the beginning we are not writing a newspaper article so we are not here to sensationalize anything frankly sensationalizing does not help anyone uh i can give you a instance of a case where a particular forensic auditor wrote a report which was to be frank more like a newspaper report complete open ended statement in terms of a has done this b has committed this fraud c has done this wrong thing and it was written in such a way that the investigating officer had no choice but to arrest two statutory auditors because of some extremely general and open comments made by the forensic auditor and when i asked that investigating officer ke saab isko yani ye basis pe kaise arrest kiya so he said the report that i have got if i did not arrest then there would be a inquiry against me in terms of when the report is so clear and sweeping so sweeping statements against the statutory auditor why is it that i have not why is it that i have not taken action against the uh, particular statutory auditor now in that case interesting part is today evening they were arrested tomorrow morning the petition high court and high court literally slammed the investigating officer saying how could you arrest so they were immediately let off in the on the next day itself but the investigating officer had to arrest because he said if i would not arrest tomorrow there will be a departmental inquiry against me saying itna so point that i am trying to make is simple when we are writing a report we are writing a report to give facts we are writing a report not to pass judgments over people because let us understand even when a cbi or a ed or any investigative officer when they file a charge sheet they are also effectively stating an allegation which tomorrow becomes a proven fact only when the court determines that the person is guilty of fraud so we have to be very careful that we frankly do not have the power nor the judgment nor the necessary requirement to pass sweeping statements with respect to any matter and that's where we have to be very careful in terms of how we especially write our report because we don't know for absolutely no reason whatsoever otherwise we will be putting a fellow professional only in more trouble so what could be a forensic audit report really look at i mean this is for the sake of it i mean basically there should be a cover page there should be a table of contents uh, there should be a clear methodology in terms of how we have gone about doing our things uh, there should be definitely an executive summary in terms of highlighting the key points detailed observations and one of the important things also nowadays we realize with time is that 
there should be an annexure which clearly specifies what was the scope of work and which uh, to what extent i mean which observations are in relation to which part of the scope of work and which part of the scope of work we were not able to complete because of lack of access to information so i think if that reconciliation is clearly given that definitely helps in the whole process there were certain case studies i mean i'll just run through them in terms of what have been observed and i think these are only for the sake of academic uh, interest in terms of various kind of case studies that i have observed as a part of whatever doing a few forensic audits so for example there is a a limited which is the borrower and i'll also speak in terms of how these were identified because i mean like like we say uh, lighter note most forensic audit observations in hindsight look obvious इन टर्म्स ऑफ कि अरे हाँ ये तो यार ये तो ऑब्वियस है ये ये ऐसा फाइंड आउट ही करना ही चाहिए था बट बट वेन यू आर एक्चुअली लुकिंग एट इट इन अ लीनियर प्रोसेस इट इज नॉट दैट ऑब्वियस इट इज नॉट दैट ऑब्वियस दैट यू एक्चुअली फाइंड इट आउट एट द सेम पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम ऑन अ लाइटर नोट इट इज मोस्ट डेंजरस इफ समबडी यू इज अपॉइंटेड आफ्टर यू फाइंड आउट समथिंग मोर देन वॉट यू हैव डन सो दैट इज अनादर पार्ट ऑफ द होल स्टोरी बट फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन दिस केस ए लिमिटेड हैज गिवन अ count they have given an advance to a to be limited which is an undisclosed but a related like i said a related unrelated party in that sense to so 60 crores given which is given to another c limited d which is given to d limited and which is given back as a unsecured loan from promoter so basically this was a typical case of bank loan so the 60 crores was money borrowed from a bank which was routed and which came back to the same company as a promoter contribution this was a clear case how were we able to really identify this we were able to identify this because this assignment was being done along with cbi and that's why we had access to the bank statements of b bank statements of c both that's why we were able to because this leg we could find out from a limited which the bank had given but this leg in terms of what went from b to c and what went from c to d is what we were able to identify because the bank statements were given by indel because cbi was also involved so we were able to get it and let let me be clear i mean i wish to also clearly identify in this cases how we found this out because many a times what happens in many speeches in forensic audit the the approach is as if oh, we have done something fantastic out of the universe frankly nothing of this is there most cases what kind of findings actually come about is purely dependent on the kind of access to information that one has and in my experience i can tell you very frankly if a bank appoints you sometimes the biggest challenge is to even get the consortium members to give the bank statement so only when a investigating agency is involved is when you can actually get bank statements beyond the company because as per law also if it is say a bank which has given a loan to a limited and if the same bank has given a loan to b limited also by law they cannot give the bank statements of b limited to the forensic auditor who is appointed so it is only when an investigating agency is involved then this entire transaction or this loop we were able to find out second case was where a limited sold 60% of products to related parties and then they were purchasing 60% of products from another related parties and which were again getting knocked through knocked off through jv now this was a typical case where uh, purchase from one related party uh, which is not in operation and purpose was to disclose higher turnover and financial statements and to obtain a higher drawing power from lenders so that was the whole purpose of this kind of transaction secondly there was a case where a limited had money had transferred money under lc against some fake purchases to be limited which was undisclosed and non operating related party but frankly there was no purchases in the books at all so it was only a lc which was open and which was discounted with the bank and then effectively it got never paid so then that's where the borrower became a npa and that's where then forensic audit was initiated so this was essentially a case of siphoning of the bank's funds through letter of credit with no underlying transaction now here also interesting thing that we need to look at is understanding the business now what was the nature of business and for what purpose is the lc being given now here the nature of business was electronics but the lc for purchase was for rice now that is where the first red flag as you as forensic auditor should also go up ki why should a company which is into electronics be purchasing rice in the first place so i think that itself is is one of the 
then next case is uh, where a limited as a borrower was selling something at 2000 rupees to b limited which is a disclosed related party and it was purchasing the same product at 3000 per unit from the same related party so it was again siphoning of bank funds through purchases at higher price than sale of the same price now this is again something which could be possibly there especially in a ibc transaction because this is how you would also sort of in the two years when you know you are going towards insolvency this could be a mechanism done by certain companies to in a way drain out whatever money is there so that this is essentially a preferential transaction to to me or a or a extortionate or undervalued transaction in that sense but basically this is a mechanism by which the money is being drained out of the system knowing fully well that there is going to be a problem later okay illicit money or third of laundering cash into the banking system again this was a particular transaction which we had done on behalf of a investigative agency and this was a very detailed transaction so this was the layer 5 which was the last layer now where in a particular company which was a limited b limited c limited and d limited were investing into equity shares now this is all pre 2014 when uh, it was done much later but the transactions pertain to a period which is prior to 2014 and why 2014 because in 2014 is when the income tax act was amended to say that any uh, so so basically uh, the the taxation with respect to share premium i think that came around that time where any amount which is more than the uh, the fair value will be taxable as hand, in the hands of the company receiving the money for issue of equity shares that provision came in 2014 i guess so this was a transaction before that so b limited c limited and d limited were investing humongous amounts of money in a limited at some crazy premium amounts this was the layer 4 what was layer 3 there was a ef which was a partnership firm which was making business payments to b c and d limited before that there were certain business payments in layer 2 which were being done by gh and i which were proprietorships or they were persons and then first layer is where j k l m n o p q r all of these were proprietorships which were typically incorporated in one bank of a particular state where the incorporation had happened typically there was no incorporation frankly because these were bank accounts created by using some kycs cash was being deposited practically at a limit which was just below the ctr limit within 2 to 3 days of the cash being deposited from each of these it was being transferred to the next layer and before the end of the year these entire accounts or sorry these entire bank accounts for each of these parties were closed so imagine a situation where after 1st april a bank account is opened during the year there are transactions worth crores and at the end of the year there is no bank account so there is no question of even if there is a pan the person itself is not traceable there is no return file there is nothing so whatever cash is deposited entirely is used to in a way float funds to the next level which is floated floated this way now again we are very clear what was happening here is basically cash got converted and it came into this particular company at the end of 5 years now important thing is again here because we were able to operate on behalf of a investigative agency once we realized this is happening that is when we went to the next layer that is when we went to the next layer that is when we went to the next layer and that is where we were able to actually find out what is happening because otherwise in any case if we were not working on behalf of a investigative agency it would have been impossible to even get bank statements of bc and d so i think that we need to very clearly identify because most times what happens otherwise the findings come as if the forensic auditor has some done some phenomenal i mean it is sometimes there but it is to a large extent with i would say is that to a large extent it is purely dependent on the access to financial information and the tools that one really deploys now nowadays what is really common is in terms of the ponzi scheme now what could be a typical operandi modus operandi of a ponzi scheme there are customers or typically investors 
who because of some kind of greed or some kind of things and this could involve people who decide to give any kind of fixed return or this could also involve people who say that you give me money i will give you a certain return and for that i'll invest your money in the stock market and uh, because sebi clearly to my understanding sebi clearly debars or is is clear that no person can give a commitment of a fixed return when investing in the stock market so there could be basically any kind of a scheme where people invest money in a scheme which could be a ponzi scheme pool out of which a large commission is actually paid to the agents themselves which is again then reinvested into the scheme and through which the partial repayment happens so it is just a circuitous transaction other payments also happen and over a period of time money is siphoned to group companies affiliate organizations or advances investments in equity benami properties and at the end of it some point of time this whole structure has to collapse at which point of time whoever is the last person in the chain is the one who is in a way stuck up so this is a typical case of a forensic audit scheme now what is it that one has to be really careful about when undertaking a forensic audit or generally careful about is that if any kind of a transaction where <clears throat> any industry which shows or any company which shows beyond industry performance when the rest of the industry has suffered a slowdown so during covid if some hotel says that okay my sales has doubled or tripled then in that case one has to be cautious ki exactly where are you located who or who is staying with you during covid so that has to be like i said this is not necessarily a fraud but this should raise a red flag in your mind in terms of there should be something that one has to look at in more detail then consistent growth in profit before tax while operating cash flows continues to be negative now this is one of the most basic check that at least i do is that i always look at the cash flow i look at the operating cash flow now if there is a operating cash flow and always compare the operating cash flow with the ebitda of the business or the pbt of the business and over a period of time if the if the difference in the operating cash flow and the profit before tax keeps on widening then it is apparent that there are a lot of non cash transactions which are happening in the business and then one has to be really cautious because the nature of the two items are such that in one year one can be higher next year one can be lower but over a period of time you see a consistent trend where <clears throat> the difference between the two is widening then you mean then it is very clear that for example a lot of sales are being booked which are not getting recovered Uh, or things like that, which essentially translate into a non-cash item, and that one has to be cautious. Very high level of transactions with related parties, transactions which parties which do not appear to be related to nature of business. Like I said, in a electronics business, somebody who is taking a LC for purchase of rice uh, is is obvious. High level of bad debts and write-offs. knocking of debtors against different creditors a typical trait if you do any transaction audit under ibc where money is receivable from a something is payable to b and then you pass a entry where you say b account debit to a account so you knock off a creditor against a different debtor only no why should that happen unless it is a very clear transaction where you are clear that you are trying to benefit a particular party uh, for a particular reason well funnily where i have seen cases where typically when you say shell company or coca company on a lighter note the shell companies or coca companies are companies with the most impeccable track record as far as compliance are concerned so typically a shell company or a coca company will have tds which is paid on the exact day where is there in during the year there is no single interest paid even on tds where the advance tax computation is also correct and there is no substantial refund also now who can manage such a thing unless you know at the beginning of the year only what is going to be the profit for the year so i think this is also i wouldn't say on a lighter note for a company where the and unless i mean unless the company is very reputed and large and you know the systems but where the compliances are absolutely impeccable where there is not even delayed interest on any tds amount i think one has to be also somewhere careful in terms of how is it that advance tax be but बराबर है और रिफंड भी नहीं है और कैसा है देन फ्रीक्वेंट चेंजेस इन अकाउंटिंग एंड कंप्लायस रिलेटेड स्टाफ लास्ट लास्ट थिंग व्हिच इज ऑब्वियस वेयर द प्रमोटर लाइफस्टाइल डज नॉट हैप्पी हैपन टू बी इन सिंक विद द फाइनेंशियल परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ बिजनेस बिजनेस का कुछ भी हो प्रमोटर का लाइफस्टाइल चेंज नहीं हो रहा है सो दैट यू हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल दैट इज द केस
okay so the other things in case of new bank loans which are used to service existing debt service obligations or companies working capital cycle didn't seem to require any cap working capital finance which are the other things one one has to be careful about or there could be mismatch in amounts as per the stock statements and books and submitted to between stock and debtors as per books and what is submitted to the bank which is now required to be cover as far as caro is concerned loans and advances to companies which are already struck off from mca again something which is now required to be reported under caro banking carried out through banks other than consortium banks and i think recently now rbi has also started acting on this in terms of to my knowledge sending even a uh, specific communication to banks to explain this and requesting banks to not do this uh, then sales accounted in books post tax rate but company claim that sales are fake now this is also sometimes happens that sales are accounted in the books which are post tax rate so after a tax rate happens is when the company accepts that or the company has claim later on that the entire sales are fake i mean typically unfortunately puts the auditor in a mess but uh, one has to be a bit careful about it uh, loan is processed to a party considering it as a group of the part of the group though the party was never technically a part of the group so this is sometimes more so from the banker's perspective that the entire proposal is written as if the company is a part of a larger group though nowhere it is specifically written that it is actually a part of the group and the entire assessment credit assessment credit approval process happens as if that particular company is a group company of so and so uh, larger group but in reality it is never there is no guarantee no letter of comfort nothing taken and when the pro when the problem really happens then the bank is completely at a loss because then the group doesn't stand by that particular party uh yeah company undertaking a job work but stock received included in drawing power calculation so if a company is undertaking job work in reality it is only receiving material and giving back the material so where should there be a question of really working capital against inventory because the inventory doesn't even belong to the company so i think again understanding the business is of paramount importance but this is a actual case where we observed that company was doing only job work where it was receiving material where the only fee that it was receiving on the income side was job work charges but the entire inventory which was received was technically hypothecated to the bank and based on pledged to the bank and based on which uh, the drawing power was calculated lastly two slides on companies act now what has companies act 2013 done with related to fraud now this is covered by section 143 12 of the companies act and the institute has issued a guidance note in terms of reporting thereon so it covers frauds which are actual or attempted by officers or employees of the company and now this is going somewhere beyond uh, what we thought could be the limitation because it also talks about frauds which are not only actual it also talks about attempted frauds now frankly it is practically and again this is applicable to the statutory auditor now not to the forensic auditor but attempted fraud by the employees or officers on the company so employees or officers of the company if they have committed a fraud on the company then that is something which is getting covered here and this includes actual or attempted frauds now in case of frauds where the individual amount is more than 1 crore what is to be done the auditor is supposed to report to the audit committee within 2 days of the matter coming to his knowledge if the audit committee then has to provide a reply within 45 days of such communication within 15 days of such reply from the audit committee the auditor has to forward his report to the audit committee the audit committee's replies thereon and auditor's observations on such replies to the central government so within <clears throat> 15 days of receiving such response if the auditor fails to receive any reply from the audit committee within 45 days still within 15 days of that he is still required to make a submission to central government and how is the how is the how is the submission required to be done it has to be through a report which is filed in form ADT4 uh, which is essentially as of today a print out along with other documents to be submitted by registered post or speed post to the secretary mca now this is with respect to frauds with individual amount more than 1 crore in case of frauds with individual amount of less than 1 crore the auditor is supposed to report the fraud to the audit committee within 2 days of coming to his knowledge and interestingly there is a clause which says that the details of fraud with value of less than 1 crore 
have to be reported in the board's report to the shareholders. Now, this is interestingly what, frankly, I have at least not seen in any board's report where any amount of fraud less than one crore is to be reported to shareholders. But frankly, I have not seen because what is more than one crore technically goes to the central government and is confidential. So that is not report required to be reported to the shareholders. But whatever is less than one crore in a way is supposed to be reported to the shareholders. But at least that's something which is not seen. Now, what happened here is what? That the institute through the guidance note said that whatever is a fraud which comes to the notice of the auditor and which is not known to the company, then you follow this process. So effectively, the institute effectively said that if the company knows of it before you know of it, then you don't need to do any of this. That is what the institute said. And that is why since 2143-12, since it got enacted, Till now, practically, nobody was doing anything because normally the company, it is obviously the company which will know of the fraud and then the statutory auditor, which will most probably. So last year, NFR has issued a circular dated 26 June 2023. It says that the statutory auditor is duty bound to submit the form ADT4 to the central government. Even in cases where the statutory auditor is not the first person to identify the fraud or suspected fraud. So now, especially in case of companies where NFRA is applicable or NFRA governed companies, it is very clear now that irrespective of what the institute has said, even if the auditor is not the first person to identify the fraud or suspected fraud, then in that case, still the entire process has to be followed. And accordingly, this ADT4 has to be reported to the central government. And the other thing that they say is that the statutory auditor shall exercise his or her own professional skepticism while evaluating the fraud and need not be influenced by legal opinion provided by the company or its management. So I think this is a new change. Uh, obviously, the implication of this with respect to banks is, is a bit tricky because, first of all, the genesis of this is, again, for banks, there are, again, two broad categories in case of public sector banks and other banks because most public sector banks are not companies at all under Companies Act because State Bank, for example, is a separate corporation. Other public sector banks were nationalized under a, under a specific law. And then thereafter, they are listed and governed by LODR. But technically, to my knowledge, most public sector banks are not companies under Companies Act 2013 at all. But all private banks, in a way, this is applicable. But like I said, even with respect to the FMRs, there are three types of FMRs. One is with respect to credit frauds, second is operational frauds, and third is internet-oriented frauds. So this will typically be applicable in respect of operational frauds where an officer or employee of the bank itself has defrauded the bank in a way. And that also typically uh, the master circular gives a time of six months for the bank to complete the process of vigilance to determine staff accountability. At the end of it, they have to, depending on the level, and depending on the nature of bank, they have to file a complaint with either CBI or with the local police and whatever. And accordingly, at that point of time, that particular bank will need to uh, basically find out uh, whether this entire process needs to be followed and accordingly it has to be uh, reported. And uh, this, But obviously, this also covers attempted fraud. So I think it, it's still a dicey situation. Most people, for the sake of safety, are just for amounts which are more than one crore, anyway, reporting it to the central government as a part of adequate precaution. But especially for banks, it is still a bit open issue uh, because RBI anyway requires very stringent reporting. But for other companies, I think this is a norm and one has to really factor it. And again, this is not typically forensic audit, but this since it covered frauds, I thought it is necessary to cover it because most of us are also statutory auditors. So this is an important point that we need to cover while we do it. So I think... This was broadly the presentation in terms of what a forensic audit is and the various angles in terms of uh, the whole forensic audit exercise. Uh, this was from my side, but we'll be happy to hear any views or take any questions uh, if there are any. Omkar, are you there?
Hello. Uh, yeah. So I'll I'll be happy if uh, there are any questions or any uh, thoughts, comments, uh, or else we can close. Yeah. Hi, Shruth. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to understand uh, when you do, when you, when we conduct the uh, audit, forensic audit, and say there are two partners or multiple partners, and uh, one partner has a suspect on the other partner that he has siphoned the funds. So by the time we conclude uh, the, uh, the, or gather the evidence that there is really a situation, uh, how do we, uh, I mean, how do we commence our review without uh, letting someone know, letting third person know, or letting the other partner know that there is a review going on? If you can give some tips on that. So you are saying that there are two partners and one partner suspects the role of another partner. Perfect. And uh, how should you do a review without the other person knowing? Right. Because this is a challenge, you know, and uh, especially when you are not a regular, uh, usual internal, uh, usual statutory auditor, you are a third person who's, uh, who, who has, who understands forensics. Well, to give you, I mean, the real answer it is very difficult to do it in that way. But if you are really required to do it, then the person who wishes to understand what is happening should have adequate access to all the necessary documents of the organization. First of all, when you say that some partner is doing something, uh, normally there is a presumption that the partner who is suspecting has some, some sense of what the other person is doing. And to that extent, if the, if that, if, if information pertaining to that area of operation or that particular nature of expenditure or something is available in terms of documentation with the partner, then at least to some extent it is possible to do it. But if the information which is required to undertake the forensic audit, if that cannot be even culled out or that cannot be extracted without the other person even knowing what is happening, then it is very difficult. Yeah. So uh, any tips around, any possible tips from your experience or something like that? The possible tips are then that's what, no? see, first of all, see the partner who is talking about the other partner, that partner has to have a sense of what exactly is wrong because generally something is wrong, then it is anywhere difficult. So there has to be at least a sense of what could be wrong or what area is there some wrongdoing or what kind of additional money is the other person taking out through some kind of a mechanism. There has to be some clear suspicion. And then whatever is the information which is required to go deep into that, if that information can be extracted by the partner, by the first partner, without the knowledge of the other partner, then to that extent, a forensic auditor can still go into it. Okay, perfect. And uh, any, uh, by any chance, can we, uh, when we are sure that there is a, uh, considering the lifestyle of the partner, which is exorbitantly uh, high or exorbitantly uh, better than uh, as compared to his income levels from the firm, uh, can we ask uh, for the bank statement, his bank statements? See, I mean, I, see, I, I, I'm presuming that this is a situation where you are neither of the partners. Because, I mean, so the point is that uh, if, if you are, it depends on who you are and what you are doing. Because, see, bank statement, if you no, ask we are auditors for, only, no. We are forensic okay. auditors. Yeah. <laughs> see, if you are forensic auditors, then you can very clearly ask. But see, I mean, see again, practically, it is if you ask my bank statement because somebody has a presumption that my uh, lifestyle is way beyond what I'm earning, then uh, I will not give. No? So, frankly speaking, in that case, you will not have the legal power. In that case, there are certain other means by which you can actually find out what is the kind of assets that I own. Uh, there could be some kind of uh, what they call as gender uh, uh, forensics or some kind of actual uh, other methods by which you try and find out whether the lifestyle of the person is really beyond what is stated as the source of earnings. And then that can be a case which is built. So, 
I think to answer your question, uh, in, in, in such a case, uh, if you are the forensic auditor, see, because if you are a forensic auditor and this, this, is, this is almost a very uh, dicey kind of a situation where one partner has appointed you to do a forensic audit on another partner, in which case I think you will have to do most things which are completely informal. Perfect. Yeah, I got you. Uh, we have been doing that only. So I thought that if, if there is anything anything better than this. Oh, yeah. It will it will be informal. All right. Uh, so just one last question, which is there on the chat box. Uh, if there is yeah. any whistleblower complaint, how it has to be taken up? Can every whistleblower complaint be trusted, or in, should it be like first you know segregated, legit or non-legitimate? Is there any criteria for that? See, normally in most large companies, the whistleblower mechanism is supposed to be monitored by the audit committee. Now, typically the audit committee, all the whistleblower complaints are put up to the audit committee and then depending on the nature of complaint, it is typically the audit. Normally, the nature of the complaint determines to what extent uh, it has to be investigated. Because see, to be, to be very honest, to be frank, put yourself into the shoes of a person who receives a whistleblower complaint. Now, if a complaint is specific, then it can be investigated. If you tomorrow get a complaint as an audit committee and say ki yahan pe sab chor hai, now how are you what what are you going to do about it? So, point is if a whistleblower complaint is actually specific, which gives some specific aspects and which talks about specific situations then I would believe that most good audit committees will tend to appoint a firm which is an outsider, depending again on levels. Because if it is about something which is in a large company, if it is something at a purely operational level, then sometimes even somebody who is within the company at a fairly senior level can investigate. If the allegation is against somebody which is very senior, then typically you might get an external person to investigate that. But in both cases, it could be investigated only if the complaint is specific. Because otherwise, it is impossible. In a large company, if you get a general general complaint saying that there is purchases mein fraud in so how are you supposed to investigate? So I think it will it will really depend on that. Sir, this is... Yeah, Hello. Mehul. Yeah, sir, this is Mehul Mehta here. Uh, I have a general question for new practitioners as well as the small firms. Like you referred so many tools uh, for this uh, IT tools, basically, like IDEA, and there are ACL, as well as other plethora of tools are available for forensic audit or maybe data analysis. Now, uh, can you suggest some of the tools? Because see, we as a small firms, first of all, we are very much tight on the budget. We don't have budgets like big for or uh, big firms. So can you just suggest, suggest that what type of tools, not necessarily brands or uh, trade names, but what type of tools we should have to start with a forensic uh, auditing practice? See, I think forensic audit, <clears throat> like I said, to a large extent, it is common sense. If I if I really say a specific tool in terms of Excel or in terms of data analytics, I think IDEA can help to a large extent. Uh, IDEA as a tool, in fact, to my knowledge, I don't know if it still exists, but Institute also has got some kind of a tie up with IDEA in terms of uh, it being available at a at a cheaper price for, uh, I mean, so some kind of a cheaper price. Obviously, when I say cheaper, still the licenses cost some some amount in a year. Uh, but I would say that, see, I mean, any, any tool we need to be very careful is like any tool, again, we need to spend time on it to know how it is supposed to work. So there is no tool which is like you put a bank statement and you get uh, what you want. There is no tool like that. So finally, what you wish to gain out of it is what one has to be very clear. One has to put time in terms of understanding how that tool works. But if you want, I mean, to give a specific example, idea is something that we use. So idea is one part. Technology uh, in terms of, like I said, so we uh, also, but that that's like a separate thing altogether. In terms of, for example, mobile imaging or email server backups and all these are like very specialized technology uh, support services and I would say that if you do not have those in-house there is no harm in taking help from outsiders who are specialized in that in terms of handling that part of the work so somebody for example if if, if you know or if, if there is an assignment which, uh, which which should involve a mobile imaging then in that case there is no harm in terms of uh, taking help of any kind of a 
company or any kind of a set of people who specialize in that kind of digital forensics and take their help and accordingly do that work. All right. So uh, I think we've uh, almost reached the time to conclude the session as well as the questions have been answered. And of course, uh, so, so, so your uh, contact details probably will be available with everybody so they can reach you offline if uh, any questions are still pending. I, I, I hope that that's not a problem. Not at all. Not at all. I think I, uh, there is one question from Aditi which says, do you have any tips for maintaining secrecy of a forensic audit? When do when we do forensic audit, sharing information is also to do control. Actually, there is, see, I mean, maintaining secrecy is an essential part of everything that we do, right? Because even if you are doing a statutory audit or even taxation work, I think uh, general professional etiquette as well as the ICAI rules, regulations or our code of conduct very clearly says that we cannot be, and it is a fundamental principle of what, the work that we do that we should not be disclosing or divulging any client related information to others. And especially in a forensic audit, we have to be very careful because uh, you have to be also, depending on the nature of forensic audit that you are doing, sometimes the media people are also equally concerned and they want information. So you have to be very careful with respect to that because uh, especially that aspect, one has to be very, very careful. Okay. Uh, so, so, would you be uh, sharing the presentation? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. I will send an email to the branch so you can share it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So I think we are done. I, I think somebody can you specify some other laws which are important if you want to be a forensic auditor, as you said, PM, PMLA. And can you also tell some other acts? I think, I mean, PMLA is one act. Secondly, MPID is another. Fundamentally, uh, the Evidence Act, CPC, CRPC, or I think the new names for that. I mean, the new Bhartiya Nyaya Kaida or law that has come in. Essentially, it's like the similar kind of law. So I think better to read that to get a fair good sense of uh, forensic audit, yeah, as in the different kind of laws that are typically available, applicable. Okay, so I think we are done with the question and if there are any additional, if we still receive further, we'll definitely ensure to forward it to you, sir. Sure. So at the outset, first let me, you know, kindly seek your excuse that I couldn't be present for the session. I had, uh, I had come to Pune for some hearing and therefore I was had to be just uh, opted out for that uh, limited time. So very sorry for that. So, so today, uh, thank, firstly, thank you that you accepted this webinar invitation because as I said in the beginning that uh, now not much of us are very used to this webinar being conducted on a very recurrent basis owing to the fact that we are open post the COVID. But still, uh, because it takes some more patience and uh, you know time involvement dedicatedly to sit in the screen, front of screen and keep addressing. So thank you so much for that. Secondly, uh, despite the fact that I believe not being a CT event also, the turnout was superb. And most importantly, people have very willingly given their feedbacks. And I think you are uh, also a spectator to those uh, wonderful feedbacks. So that in itself speaks volumes about the session. Uh, on behalf of Tane Brand, Sushutar, firstly, I would again like to thank because for two reasons that uh, it doesn't take much to, you know, get uh, concurrence from you for hosting a lecture or conducting your session for which do people do keep asking us intermittently and therefore uh, it is our rather, uh, uh, you know, privilege to have you again over here and soon as somebody has also suggested that for a longer duration also and half day session from you on this topic particularly would also be, you know, definitely a welcome thing. So we'll ensure to see that how we can, you know, again catch hold of you and get you in Tane for a larger or a longer session. Sure, we'll be happy. So on behalf of Tane branch I, and on behalf of all the participants, I uh, thank you and I express a heartiest vote of thanks to you. And also, I mean, I'll also definitely you already have the feedback. We'll, as, as you can all see that it's a overwhelming one. So therefore, uh, thank you once again for dedicating your time, sir. And on behalf of Sani Branch, uh, I do keep an open welcome to you for all the programs to come in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone.